Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This is lesson number 30 and the last lesson of our 2 Corinthians primer. We're going to be covering the entire chapter, 14 verses, as Paul begins to wind down and conclude uh, this tremendous epistle. Last time, which was two weeks ago, we looked at Paul's abundant love. We saw, if you glance your eyes back to chapter 12, we saw some very uh, influential things that all, in, in light of all the opposition that the Apostle Paul faced with the Corinthians as he was their father in the faith, that he had begotten them through the gospel As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he was their apostle. He was given authority for their edification. And even in light of them only acknowledging him in part and all the other things that he faced in light of the false apostles that commended themselves and measured themselves among themselves, which wasn't a wise thing to do, and Paul boasting not in the wonderful visions and revelations that he would come to, for he had that thorn in the flesh, but rather he would boast in his infirmities, is that he says this in verse 14. He says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you and will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Paul had an abundant love for all the saints, but you would think if any of the saints, his love would be more restrained, it would be to the Corinthians, yet even in light of them not loving him so much, he abundantly loves them. And that is manifest, as manifest in the gentleness and meekness of Christ that he is putting on display, that he is patterning. Uh, And we also see, and we will continue to see in chapter 13, his call for the Corinthians to repent, to change their mind regarding the things that they are believing, the things that they're thinking, and that therefore their conduct and uh, behavior would follow suit. And so this evening, as we get into chapter 13, we're going to take a look at what Paul says here, and we'll read it in a moment, uh, a proof of Christ speaking in him. That is what they have been seeking, and he is going to describe that a little bit more. We're going to take a look at this expression, then he urges them and exhorts them to examine themselves, and then one more time look at the power that is given to Paul for their edification. With that being said, I'm going to read chapter 13. We'll have a word of prayer and then begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, And ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. 
Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we are thankful for this time. May we heed Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians. In light of all that we have covered over these 29 lessons, the things that he's going to summarize and encapsulate for us and review for us, that we might, in light of them, examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. Not so much in regards to the issue of our justification, but whether we be in the faith, whether we be believing the things that we ought to be believing as believers, as those that are justified, and not being beguiled, not being tossed to and fro, not functioning as foolish believers by all the winds of doctrines that are out there and the enticement and the allurement that so easily ensnares us. But rather may we heed these exhortations, these instructions, these corrections, these reproofs, these rebukes and admonitions that Paul gave the Corinthians and that you gave the Corinthians through the writing of the Apostle Paul, your words to them. They are your words to us. And so, Father, may we truly examine ourselves and be pursuing the very things that you desire us to pursue, the very things you desire for us to believe and you instruct us to do. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Again, Paul here in chapter 13 winds down this epistle and he says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. And then he goes on to say, really the kind of the significance that is attached to that. In the next sentence, he says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. It is evident here that he wants the Corinthians to be established If you will, come back with me to Romans chapter 16. We have made the connection, or at least I've tried to draw the connection for us in past studies, both in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, especially when we were in 1 Corinthians, that he's writing the book of Romans when he's at Corinth. And therefore, it is of no surprise and it's no coincidence to us that 1 Corinthians is written uh, that, that, that we understand the Corinthians knew Romans doctrine when Paul was there. He's writing it to the saints at Rome while he's in Corinth, while he's in Sancria. And so it is obvious and clear that he would be teaching them those things. First Corinthians then builds upon that. And there we have it in Scripture itself in the order of the books of these epistles, not necessarily or well, when they're written, but the doctrinal order in which we need to have them placed in. And so, when you get to the end of the book of Romans, look what he exhorts uh, the saints at Rome, what he wants to do with them. He says in verse 25, Now to him that is of power to what? Establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God, only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. He wants to establish them. Come back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, when he began this epistle to the saints there at Rome, look what his end was in verse 11 of Romans 1. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be, what? Established. The some spiritual gift isn't the spiritual gifts here. It was the body of the doctrine of faith in which he is going to dispense to them, that he's going to give to them. His intention was to give it to them uh, in his physical presence, but he hasn't been there, and so he writes this letter in his absence and sends it to them so that by the end of it, they would be established. And then when he writes at the end, he says, now to God is is the power to establish you. That's to fortify the establishment and build upon what now is established. The Corinthians are having difficulty with that. 
Uh, it takes more letters for Paul to write. Beyond just him being there teaching them Romans doctrine, you have these letters that follow him being there that his word would be established. We've seen this throughout 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Again, the, the lack of acknowledgement to Paul and his apostleship. The, one of the, the major themes throughout 1 and 2 Corinthians is Paul defending his apostleship. And the reason why he's defending his apostleship isn't simply to prove that he is unique from the 12 apostles, but rather, and more importantly, that his apostleship is for their edification. It's to build them up in the doctrine. And the doctrine, the body of doctrine, the faith, is the very words, the very doctrine that conforms them to the image of Christ. You deny Paul's apostleship, you're going to be denying the doctrine for their edification. You're going to be denying the process of being conformed to the image of Christ. And instead, they have turned to false apostles. They have been influenced by those that commend themselves among themselves, measuring themselves uh, by themselves, and they're not wise. They're fools, and the Corinthians are, uh, have given themselves to this. And so, as we turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, when he says what he says there in this verse 1, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, that is, by his presence and his writings, he says, shall every word be established. Paul hasn't changed his words to them. In fact, with the things he's going to go on to say, we're going to see it's the very same things he's been telling them. If you come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you can remember, and we're going to be doing quite a bit of this tonight, flipping back and forth within this letter as well as in 1 Corinthians, as he summarizes and reviews with them the very things that he's been dealing with them uh, in if you remember, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, one of the things that he was being accused of was going against his word, going back on his word, and therefore would put into question his very doctrine, his teaching that's given to him of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you look at verse, uh, pick it up here in verse 13, he says, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. As also you have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded that I use lightness, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by who? us. So when he says by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the issue is let every word be established, is that they need to understand and recognize that the reason why Paul is spending so much time in writing to them is because it's not established within them. And he is, in one sense, wrestling with them in regards to this. We saw the battle of what Paul, the, the spiritual warfare of bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and that the Corinthians needed to do that, and he's bringing that up to the Corinthians is because they're not doing that very thing. And so they need these words to be established within them, and so at the end as he writes, he says, this is what it's supposed to be working, that you would be established in these things that I have taught you. It's been two, it's been three times now, Therefore, let every word be established. He goes on, turning back to chapter 13, verse 2. He says, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, 
I will not spare. Now this has been one of the other threads throughout these two epistles. Come all the way back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you can recall, in 2 Corinthians, he talked about his, 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 his letters are weighty, but his bodily presence is weak. And so there's this assumption that Paul is just speaking and teaching these things with the authority in his letters, but when he would be there present with them, he would be all but authoritative. But when we read, in fact, before we get to chapter 4, come with, back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This was really all the way back here. And you look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 2, he says, And I, brother, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. That's what they think that he's going to come again unto them with. He says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. It wasn't with the Corinthian rhetoric. It wasn't with the enticing words. It wasn't with the elaborate uh, speech of the Corinthian day. He says, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He talks about the what he had given to them, wasn't his great oratory skill, but nevertheless, it's bare bones teaching and preaching the words of it was the demonstration of the spirit and of power. It was final. The Corinthians, like to just hear that which was new, and it was always a toss-up, and it was always the issue of what's new, and going after, tossed to and fro, and he says, I didn't come unto you that way. I didn't come unto you the way in which the other Corinthian leaders come to you and the teachers and the orators. I came with you with power. Power that is everlasting. Power that is final. And that's what he means when he says, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And because of that, their faith can stand in the power of God. Now come back over to chapter 4. And he's warning them, and then look at what we encountered here in chapter 4, verse 18. He says, now some are puffed up, as though I would not come to you. Now this is 1 Corinthians, okay? He says, but I will come to you shortly. We just read that in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, when they said, well, you said you were coming, but you haven't. So if your word's not your bond and all these kind of things, and therefore you're teaching, what do we have to say to that? And he says, all the promises of God in Christ are yea. It's not the issue of my coming to you or not. You have to look beyond that to the issue of what is being said, what is being taught. And he says, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And then he says this, verse 21, What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? Now, if you remember 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he comes along and he says, I beseech you by the gentleness and meekness of Christ. His second letter was a furtherance of not coming so that he could come to them in meekness and hopes that they would acknowledge him in full, that they would have that godly repentance, and that they would therefore live godly in Christ Jesus. But he says if he's going to come, he's going to come with that rod. Now what is that rod? It's a, it's a rod of correction. It's a, it's a rod of, of, of not some physical punishment. It's a rod of physical correction. In other words, the way in which he's writing in his letters, he is going to be towards them in presence and in his teaching towards them. Turn over to 2 Corinthians. We were just in chapter 1. We're going to turn back there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 23. He actually brings this very thing up. He says, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. 
not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. He wants their faith to stand in God, in the Word of God, and therefore he's doing all this 16 chapters in the first letter and 13 chapters in the second letter so that they might be established, that they may acknowledge him and they might get the benefit, that second benefit of the effectual working of God's word in them so that they could be established and grow up into Christ. And he's desiring to be a helper of their joy. In other words, when he comes, if these things haven't changed, it's not going to be, at least at first, a joyful occasion. He's going to come with a rod. He's not going to come in the spirit of meekness. He is going to correct them. Everything he's doing before that is the love, is the meekness. But we'll see the issue of what he's going to do when he comes. So come back to chapter 13. So he says, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. So he's been sparing them, but he's not going to spare. Now, what is this issue of heretofore have sinned? If you remember, we dealt with that man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and the church's response to that man who had his father's wife, and the issue of how the church responded. He responded well. He responded in a godly fashion, but then the church was swallowing him up, and he was swallowed up in overmuch sorrow because the church, the now numerous members of the church were not forgiving him. So we dealt with that issue of sin, and we dealt with other numerous issues of sin throughout 2 Corinthians as of late. If you glance at chapter 12 and verse 20, he says, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. There's a certain way he wants to find them. It's interesting, over in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about that we might be found in him not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is by faith of Jesus Christ. And that's not the issue of your justification. That's the issue of the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, and the Word of God impacting your life in which those fruits of righteousness are manifest in your life. And Paul wanted to be found at the appearing of Christ if it took place in his lifetime, or when he dies, be found in Christ. Again, not just judicially in Christ, but in his sanctification, that he would be walking after the Spirit, not walking after the flesh. And so it is too with each and every one of us. And with the Corinthians, he's saying, I think I'm going to come unto you and find you such as I, I would not want you to be found in. And he says, and then I should be found unto you such as you would not. They think he's going to come weak and, and without much significance. And, and, and his meekness and his love, and it is still in his love, but it's going to be a rod. He's not going to spare them. And then he says, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. Those are the sins that he is thinking of as well as the other things contained in this letter. So back to chapter 13, verse 3, he says, Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. This is what the Corinthians have been seeking. They've been seeking a proof of Christ speaking in them. And the issue is, well, how are they evaluating that proof of Christ speaking in the Corinthians? Well, you go back to the false apostles. It was their visions and revelations that they had. It was their, their miracles, their wonders that they're doing that is catching the eyes of the Corinthian, and they say, that's power. Paul brings up his visions and revelations, and he says, I don't glory in that, even though the things that, I'm, uh, that I heard up there in the third heaven and paradise is not lawful for man to utter, which he brings the attention to, and it's the very things that he's giving the Corinthians, which they're rejecting. It's the word of God that is of the power. And so Paul says, of anything, what I will boast in is the word of God and how that's able to effectually work within me when I suffer. That when I am weak, 
then I am strong. And when I am weak, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And so what they're doing, the proof of Christ speaking to them, was not what they were looking for. Uh, it, they were looking for something else. Now, this is not all too uh, uh, unfamiliar to us when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came to his, uh, during his earthly ministry there, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the doctors, and the lawyers were all thinking and had a whole different concept of the Christ than that which he came in. And of course, which way did he come in? Meek and lowly. And here you have this very issue represented in Paul himself now, that very gentleness and meekness of Christ manifest to them, and they're looking at that as weak. And he says, no, that's actually where the power is. But he says, if you want a proof of Christ speaking in me, when I come to you, it's going to be mighty. And that's the issue of he's not going to come to spare. And he'll, he'll talk about this when we get down to verse 10. He goes on in verse 4. For though he, Christ, was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. The very thing that he's doing is consistent with the resurrection power of Christ. And I'm just going to bring it up now because he eventually concludes it down in verse 10. Just jump down to verse 10. He says, therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness. And what is this sharpness? According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Paul has a long view of their edification in focus. And if so be... He needs to use sharpness. That's what he's going to do. By the way, this is all a, a, a picture and a, and a type of the judgment seat of Christ. Listen, the judgment seat of Christ, although there will be only, when we talk about when the rapture of the church, the body of Christ takes place, and we therefore go to the judgment seat of Christ, isn't all going to be hunky and hunky-dory. You want sharpness now and to have that work within you so you don't receive sharpness then. Receive the sharpness of the Apostle Paul so you don't receive the sharpness of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is final then at that time. Not that you'll lose your salvation. We already dealt with the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But there will be loss. Why would there be loss? Well, Paul's coming along and saying there's things that need to be sharply rebuked for their good, for their edification, not for their destruction. And the issue is going to be if they don't receive the sharpness now, then at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be destroyed. That which they've built up is going to be destroyed. There's going to be a destruction and so the issue again is that sharpness. Come over with me to Titus chapter 1. There's only two places in which this issue of sharp rebuke is brought up. And you can see a parallel between what Paul is exhorting Titus to do to what Paul is doing or says he's going to do with the Corinthians if things don't change. Look at Titus chapter 1 and pick it up here in... Verse 10. Uh, look at verse uh, 9. He's jumping in, talking about the qualifications of a bishop. And he says in verse 9, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's what he's doing. Let every word be established. He's trying to persuade them. He's trying to convince them. He says, verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers, and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. 
One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them, here it is, sharply. Why? What's the purpose of rebuking them sharply? It's the same purpose in which he would come to the Corinthians with sharpness. He says that they may be sound in the faith. The Corinthians are unsound. These individuals at Crete are unsound. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Jump down to verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient. Now watch this. And unto every good work, what? Hold that, hold that word in the back of your mind. By the way, who he's speaking about here? These are justified individuals. These are believers. These are believers who are not only justified and in Christ, but they profess that they know God, but that profession of knowing God is evidently false because in works they deny Him. So much so that they're abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. What a, what a stern warning and graphic description of the spiritual ailment and this infirmity that he is making mention of. Now why is this important? How does this connect with the Corinthians? Come back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you remember 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he brought up this passage, uh, this, this, this issue, this motivation of their sacrificial giving to the poor saints at Jerusalem. But he says here in verse 8, he says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every what? Good work. Does God want us to be abominable and, and reprobate and, and disobedient unto every good work? Absolutely not. His grace gives us the sufficiency in all things that we may abound to every good work. The Corinthians weren't doing that. The ones in whom he's bringing up to Titus aren't doing that. And so what he is bringing up now as he ends this epistle, coming back to chapter 13, and the power that of God that's going to be towards them is this rebuking sharply that they might be sound in the faith. Now look at how this connects. Look at verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in what? The faith. In the faith, whether it be in the faith, the body of teaching, the, the sound doctrine, that you might be sound in, the, sound in doctrine, sound in the faith. And he says, examine yourselves. I, I, I love the way in which Paul writes. Because he says he saves this for the, the last. Imagine if he put this in the very beginning of this letter. Examine yourselves. Well, examine by what? Well, we can go off 1 Corinthians. We go off when he first came, and all those things are true and accurate. But he leaves this last so, he leaves this last so that they know that the way in which they're going to examine themselves is what they have been reading up until this point. And the issue now is to take all of that and look at it and examine themselves in light of it. God is searching our heart. He tries our hearts, Paul says to the Thessalonians. He searches our hearts, Romans chapter 8. But there's also a godly responsibility that we have in light of God's word to examine ourselves. And he exhorts them. He charges them. It's interesting that when you go look at this word, it's translated the majority of times as tempt. Tempting, temptation. It's also translated prove. 
as he says that word just in, in the same sense. It's also translated tried or try. Try yourselves. Prove yourselves. It's the issue of to inspect carefully with a view to discover truth or the real state of a thing. And the thing here is themselves. To search or inquire into facts and circumstance by interrogating. They're supposed to be interrogating themselves. Paul's been doing it. They're supposed to be doing it to themselves. The very thing that he's writing them should be reading them. To look into the state of a subject, to view in all its aspects, to weigh arguments and compare facts with a view to form a correct opinion or judgment. That's what the Corinthians are to be doing of themselves. This is what we are to be doing of ourselves in light of the truth, in light of the Word of God. Many of us who understand that the dispensation of the grace of God and the way in which God dealt with Israel and the way in which He's dealing with us now and the distinctions in that, the similarities, but also the distinction. He's not treating us as children. He's treating us as adults and what that the bearing that has upon our lives and the bearing upon that has in our prayer lives that oftentimes you can understand how this would impact our prayer life. But when you understand the issue of us proving the will of God, learning the will of God, interacting with the will of God, and then having it come to be proven in your life, prayer is going to take up a large part of your life. Then, in reflection of your reading and your studying of God's Word, you are constantly examining yourself. You're being honest. You're being genuine. You're being sincere. He knows. We can't get anything by Him. God is not mocked. He knows the motivation. He knows where our works are are coming from, whether they're acceptable to Him because they're after the Spirit or whether they deny Him because they're after the flesh. He knows. And so the issue is in our prayer lives is that in light of the things that He's teaching us and our engagement with them in prayer and having them come to bear upon our relationships in this world, we also need to be examining ourselves. It's for our good. Whether we be in the faith. And hopefully we all have a desire to be in the faith, in the teaching, in the doctrine. Because why? Because we know that this is the very thing, these are, this is the very power that conforms us to the image of Christ. He says, prove your own selves. He's already proven that they're going the wrong direction. And now he's charging them to prove their own selves. It's interesting, when, you get, when we were at the end of 1 Corinthians, he said something that was kind of like this. He said this in chapter 16 in verse 13. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. And we can see that obviously when it came in the strong, he's not talking about go lift some weights. He's talking about being strong in their mind, being strong in Christ. He uses that with the saints at Ephesus in chapter 6. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he goes on to describe that strength and the power in the whole armor of God and all that armor is spiritual and where do the spiritual matters take place in the mind, in the heart. And so again, as he's ending this epistle, he's bringing that up to them. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. And then he says this in verse 5. He, 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 he's going to tell them exactly where they're at. He says, prove your own selves, but if you don't come to the right verdict, if you're not genuine and honest, let me reassure you where you're at. Know ye not your own selves? 
how that Jesus Christ is in you. Except you'd be reprobates. Well, there's two ways you can kind of take that. You can take that in regards to the issue of our natural position, right, in Adam is one of possessing, Romans chapter 1, the reprobate mind. This issue of going after uh, uh, unrighteousness and ungodliness. And so we still have remnants of that. We still live in a world that pursues that. Yet, we are believers, but we still have that sin in us. Even though it's not supposed to reign in our mortal bodies, that's in us. That's one way in which you can take it. The way in which I understand it is in the context of their sanctification that Jesus Christ is in you. They've been baptized into Christ, yet they're functioning as a reprobate. They're functioning like they used to function. Listen, when he gives that list there in chapter 12, and he says, lest there be debates, envies, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, you go over to Romans chapter 1 where he brings up that unbelieving reprobate mind, and he says, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Many of those things are in the list. And so he comes along and says, if you don't come out with the, the right diagnosis, which he's diagnosed, us, diagnosed them already, they're straightened in their own bowels because they're unequally yoked with unbelievers. He says, for a recompense in the same, be ye enlarged. Enlarge yourself, he goes on to say, towards Paul. Your affections need to be towards Paul, not the unbelievers. And so if they don't come to the right diagnosis that Paul has in connection with his examination of them, his interrogation, his understanding of the things, then you have it flat out. Know not, ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And then he goes on in verse 6. He says, but I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. That's been proven. It's been proven in the first letter. For goodness sake, he is, came to them with the gospel. They owe, in one sense, their eternal life to Paul. Of course, he, Paul did not provide it, but Paul functioned as the ambassador towards them in which they believed he had begotten them through the gospel. As he says, he's their apostle under edification. We see this love, this patience, this long-suffering for their good throughout these two letters. And so by the time he gets to this second letter to them, he says, I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. The guy who he just got done saying in verse 13 of chapter 12, for what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. He didn't take anything from them. He's not coming to them for their money. He's not coming to them for their things. He's seeking them. He loves them. He loves them in Christ. He wants God's purpose for them in Christ to be fulfilled, to be conformed to the image of Christ. So, time and time again, example after example, Paul can now say that he's given enough evidence that they can trust, that they know, at least deep down, if they were truly examining, that they know that Paul is not a reprobate. He's not coming them with a facade. He's not coming them with in, stre in strength in regards to a bodily presence or something like that. His, his, his speech is contemptible. His bodily presence is weak. He continues to preach Christ. He's glorying in infirmities where these other men aren't glorying in their infirmities. They're boasting in their miracles, their wonders, their, their visions. Even though they pale in comparison to the visions and revelations that Paul came to. Verse 7 of chapter 13. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. If you remember back in 
chapter 7, as he was ending his argument that continued from chapter 6, he says in verse 1 of chapter 7, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He does not want them to do evil, to continue on in their evil. And Paul comes along, as he does many times before, he thinks about what they might be thinking about. And he says, not that we should appear approved. Don't do evil simply for the sake of, for us to appear approved. In other words, Paul's coming along and just getting to the bare bones issue again. Don't do evil, he's going to say, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Here's your view of us. We're reprobates, even though I trust that you know we're not reprobates, but this is how we're being, what we're being accused and what we are. And he says, then don't do evil because it's honest. Not that we might appear approved, but that it's honest. It's Paul removing himself, forsaking his reputation, and coming along and saying, there's something greater than me, there's something greater than my reputation, there's something greater than what is being said of me, and and all these kind of things, and it's the issue of do no evil. Do that which is honest. We've been learning that in Romans chapter 12. When he comes and he says, recompense to no man evil for evil. It says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And the issue of providing things honest are the things that are consistent with the wisdom that we have been given in God's word up until that point. And therefore, they're to be honest in light of what they're called unto. And that is at least that God through Christ is holy and they need to perfect holiness. Whether it's Paul being approved or not, do no evil. It's kind of like what Paul says to the Philippians in one sense when he talks about when he's in prison and he says, some indeed preach Christ Eve of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I there do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul's coming along saying, I'm not so attached to the issue of your holiness in which I'm going to get in the way. And if you need to forsake me, but still pursue it, pursue it. That's phenomenal. These false apostles will not do that. These other men will not do that because what they have in view is not God's agenda, it's their own. They want to draw people to themselves and that's what they're measuring themselves by. That's what they come along and utilize, that I'm approved, I'm blessed of God. And Paul's coming along and saying here, if you're going to look at me as a reprobate, listen. It's kind of like, listen to this. Just do no evil because it's honest with who you are in Christ. Take me out of the picture. Look at me however you want to look at me. But do no evil. Just in case one thought that Paul was actually saying that he was a reprobate, He says in verse 8, for we can do nothing against the truth before the truth. He says, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. Isn't that what what I've just been trying to explain? Hey, when you're strong, when you're doing no evil, when you're going after all these things, and we're down here suffering we're glad. How can Paul be glad? Well, isn't that what he taught them in chapter 12? 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Listen, Paul took pleasure when he was of no reputation. Even though he was the apostle of the Gentiles, when he had no reputation, he's just a small little thing. Paul, not Saul, Paul, small. And he, he, exult, he took pleasure in that. Especially if it was for the sake of someone else and them being strong, them being edified, them pursuing that which they're supposed to be pursuing. Whatever the cost, whatever at stake, whatever, however they viewed him, as long as they're going after what they're supposed to be going after. But Paul doesn't only want their strength. He says, in this also we wish even your perfection. See, he wants them to be established, but there's much more than just being established. There's the perfection. There's the moving on to Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Look what he says over to the Colossians there in chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Just pick it up here in verse 28. He says, Whom we preach, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man, what? Perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, that's not sinless perfection. Being perfect in Christ Jesus is attainable. It's achievable. It's what Paul's going after. Perfection in Christ is the issue of a maturity to the doctrine that is not only working in your head, but has touched your heart and is working outwardly unto every good work. That means you're able through the lens of the doctrine, thus you would need correction, because if, 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 if you have all that you have, then you don't need necessarily the, the, the correction uh, to be able to abound unto every good work. But the correction comes along wherever it is you might be astray in your, in, in your doctrine that is able to abound unto every good work. And it corrects that. It gets it straight. It gets it sound. So that you can take that wisdom, that you can take that uh, doctrine, and now you can come along and marry it in your relationship. Your relationships, your marriage, your family, your work, church, the government in which you're under. Every good work. And that's what he wants to do. And then present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. He says, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So he ends here saying, hey, listen, we're working on your being established. I wish for your perfection. Verse 10 of chapter 13. Therefore, as he concludes upon the things that he said, and we've already read it, we already read it. He says, Therefore, I write these things being absent, as being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. This power for edification is consistent with that resurrection power to, to build them up and conform them to the image of Christ. And then he gives his final words here in verse 11, and they are profound. He says, finally, brethren, farewell. Now, when he's saying farewell here, he's not simply coming along and saying goodbye, farewell. Farewell. There's a little bit more to it than that that you can see in the word, fair, well. This is the only time in the Bible where it's translated farewell by the King's James translators. Other places it's translated hail, glad, joyfully, greeting, Godspeed, rejoice. Here it comes at the end of the letter and the issue is Harkens all the way back to the issue of being a helper of their joy. If they 
change their mind in view of what he said, even though they view him as a reprobate, by their examination, they will fare well. And he's going to prove it to them. He's going to share it with them. And he's going to take four things and, in, and encapsulate all the things that he's been dealing with in, in four things that he exhorts them to be and how to live. And it's going to provide one great result. And those four things are be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Of course, be perfect. He just said that he even wishes for their perfection. But if you can remember... When we dealt with it, he says Christ's strength is made perfect in weakness. They have a misconception about power and strength and how it's manifest and when it's manifest. It's hearkening back to chapter 4 when he said, but we have this treasure, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. That's the power. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Listen, that is is power. He's going to build upon it in Philippians when he says in Philippians chapter 1, when he says and in nothing and in no thing terrified by your adversaries. What do the adversaries, what do their adversaries want to do? They want to terrify them. They want to strike fear in the minds and the hearts of the believers. Intimidate them. By taking away their things, maybe even taking away their life. And Paul's coming along and saying, in that, you have the power and the capacity to not be terrified. Man, do we need this today. Which is to them, listen, which is to them an evident token of perdition. Why would it be an evident token of perdition? Because they're bringing their power against you and it's not terrifying you. It's not doing the very thing that it's intended to do. Instead, that is just accelerating your growth. You look at that when they're trying to make you weak and Christ's strength is being made perfect in weakness. So you take pleasure in it. Not because of the pain and the suffering and the defaming and, the, and, and all the things that can come upon you, but what can be done in it to God's honor and glory. And he says, but to you of salvation and that of God. We can have a salvation in the midst of suffering, not out of it, but in the midst. He says in Romans chapter 8, yea, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In the things. So when he says, be perfect, the, the measure of their perfection that they need to work on in 2 Corinthians is not looking at the, the strength and the power of the world, but the strength and power of Christ manifest in weakness. That's how we started this epistle in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It was the main theme. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able, the ability, the power, the capacity to comfort them which are in any, which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And so he says, be of good comfort. Because he says in verse 5 of chapter 1, he says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Listen, there, I'm, if you've never experienced a measure of this, I pray and hope you do, but it takes being willing to suffer. Of course, our flesh doesn't want to suffer. I'm not saying you go look for suffering. 
You can escape suffering. But what I mean is when that comes, how do you respond? How do you you react? And if your gut reaction is to faint, this is too much. Why God? You haven't understood a very key doctrine in the Bible. But if you do, and if you have, it's a tremendous thing. It's a stabilizing power that when things start to go awry and things begin to shake and things to be unsturdy and you are in the midst of it, you are experiencing and can experience by the Word of God, by the doctrine, a fortification within you so that you're not being tossed in the suffering, but rather you can bring something while in the suffering. Now, of course, that is very general in description when we talk about suffering, but that's what he's speaking of here. Be perfect. The measure of maturation in Christ that they need to understand now was the issue of as they began to partake in the sufferings of Christ, they needed to also partake in the comfort. And there was much more that they needed to grow up in when it came to sufferings. And then he says, be of one mind, as you get back there at chapter 13. The factions, the divisions, the schisms that were there in 1 Corinthians are still there in 2 Corinthians. How do you know that? By all the false apostles, by all the opinions, all the thoughts, by what he said before, there's debates, envy, and wrath, stripes, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. And so what do they need? They need unity. They need fellowship. Outside of all the noise, how they're going to get that is if they acknowledge Paul. Not in part, but if they fully acknowledge Paul. They acknowledge something outside of themselves and all the divisions, and they acknowledge that there's going to be a unity. Not to mention over in Ephesians, you talk about the unity of the Spirit and the unity of the faith. And then he says, live in peace. That's something that is not marking the churches at Corinth. They're not living in peace. They're not peace among themselves. They don't have peace with others. They're to be unspotted from the world and said they're very spotted. And here's the one result. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. How is the God of love and peace going to be with them? if they're growing in their maturity in Christ, if they're benefiting from the doctrine of how to partake in the sufferings of Christ, if they're benefiting from the consolation that's in Christ, if they're striving after that unity, if they're living in peace, that's when the God of love and peace is going to be with them. The issue of walking after the Spirit, there's a responsibility that we have. It goes beyond just the issue of what we have received the moment we believed the gospel, when we believed the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's the issue of abiding in Him. It's the issue of building Him up in us. And that is through the teaching of God's Word. It is through that And through that alone, for he has limited himself to that to give us assurance of how he is with us. He is not with us through some mystical experience. He is with us when you have come to know him through the word of God. That is how he's explained who he, where he's explained who he is, what he is doing, 
and what he desires of us. Anything outside of that, it is not God with us, although we might be justified in God's sight. He says the God of love and peace shall be with you. It's the only time in which the expression the God of love is used. He uses the God of peace elsewhere. He says the God of love and peace. One, to know his love more fully, but also to be able to put on display his love to benefit of having not only peace with God, that which you have the moment you believe, but also having the peace of God and also having peace with others. That's what's going to be with us. He ends by saying, greet one another with an holy kiss. This was an expression in which they represented their brotherly love. It says, all the saints salute you as he describes that they're not only to have unity amongst themselves, but unity with other churches, and other churches are praying for them and are saluting them. And then he ends with one of the verses in all of, uh, not the only verse in all of Scripture, but one of the verses that describe the triune Godhead. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. He says, amen. The threefold provision, activity, and work of the triune Godhead is to be with them all. It's to be with them all, and it's resident on the pages of the letter in which they, by this time, have read to the end. That concludes our primer through 2 Corinthians. Is there any questions about chapter 13 or 2 Corinthians overall before we conclude tonight? Sean. Yeah. Well, my understanding, there's two um, ways in which to understand a reprobate governed by the context in which they sit, not by definition of loan. If we looked at definition alone of reprobate, we would see the issue of a unjustified man, a child of wrath, one who's pursuing just the, the ungodliness and the wickedness of, of the world. Um, that, in other words, the context of Romans chapter 1, uh, where he, uh, I made mention it before, when he specifically spoke of the reprobate mind in Romans 1 verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Uh, and then he goes on to describe what they're, they're filled with. And then I understand that the other context is what we saw in both Titus and um, uh, Second Corinthians, and that is that uh, the issue of the carnality of, of a believer, for instance, the Corinthians, a word that is utilized to draw connections of who they used to be, and yet they're still acting like. So when he says, uh, for instance, over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when he says to them, I could not speak unto you as, I'm going to get it here. He says, uh, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So they're still justified. In fact, he's going to say that in chapter 6. You've been washed, you've been justified, you've been sanctified. But yet they're walking as mere men, not as those in Christ, having the Spirit of God teaching them these holy things. And so that's what I think that Paul is also referencing in Second Corinthians, is that they, Christ is in them, although they be reprobates, that they're functioning as reprobates. And the very things that he mentioned, the divisions, the strifes, and the envyings, is the very thing that he mentions in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians as well, as the wraths, the strifes, the envyings, the backbitings, the whisperings. They're still continuing on in those things. And those are the things that's causing the divisions
that they need to, and, and the lack of unity uh, is they're functioning just like the, the world functions. And so my understanding, to sum it up, reprobate is utilized primarily in the issue of that of an unjustified man pursuing the world, but yet Paul will also bring it up in connotation to the carnality or the carnal living of the Corinthians or what we read in Titus there uh, in regards to their, their lives looking no different uh, in a lot of regards to the world in which they're uh, living in. That's my understanding. I may be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you say like for instance with Paul when he said that that they were going to say the truth means what a truth means? Right. Are all these lying things that you say about souls or do you just replicate? Yeah. And there, where I get that from is in verse thirteen that they're believers, he says, This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. So it seems like they're already in one sense in the faith, but when it comes to this issue, they need to be sound. So I carry that down with me into the next couple verses, if that makes sense. Yeah. Dimitri. I kind of did a clarification on that too. Because yeah. Because we, he also mentioned they profess to know God. Yeah. No, they're in the body because they believe the gospel. But anything further that they've professed, my, it, it, when he says there that they profess that they know God, uh, that's the issue of knowing him in the sense that it would affect the way in which they, they live. Um, we, we, we know him closely, so we have this relationship. Um, that's what that's kind of denoting there, that they, they know him and then he follows that up, but, so they might give this profession. Uh, th they are justified, but they give this profession that they have more than just that. And he says, but in works. So he's not talking about the issue of their, their initial faith in believing the gospel, but that in which they profess that they know God, they know him more than that, but in works they deny him. And so that is in one sense saying that I know God, but yet I'm not listening to him and how, to, how he works. And so they deny him and to the point in which being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate, it seems like that is an impossibility for a believer, for one that is justified to be described that way. But that is many a times in which Paul describes believers. Um, I, mean the, I mean the Corinthians. I mean, again, by all standards of Christianity, especially under the banner of, for instance, lordship salvation, right? If I don't have any fruit that proceeds from my initial faith, then I am not saved, or it's evidence I'm not saved, which comes along and Basically, they won't say this. I know this because I used to believe it. They won't say that that is a, a, a loss of salvation or anything like that, that you were never saved in the, the first place. But we know that the gospel, in order to be, ha be justified, there's no works involved. So whether I have works that follow is, is not the issue when we talk about justification. There, there's no work, so boasting is excluded. We can't, we can't boast. And so, the, it, not that there shouldn't be fruit, but it's not a determining factor of your justification. So when you understand that, that that can be so, 
then you begin to understand this context of sanctification. You're going to walk and that there could be one who legitimately believes the, the gospel is justified, will possess eternal life, but yet in their lives completely re- reject and deny him in regards to their, their works. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a possibility. Um, and I believe that those are some of the passages that describe that very thing. Um, Oh, that's interesting because there's a difference between him and Nebuchadnezzar, right? right. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, there's a slow progression of, uh, of honoring God, kind of, but then not really believing until it seems apparent at the end of his life where he actually did believe. Um, but there's, the, there's that, that paradigm of the Pharisees and Sadducees who you could point to and look at and say, wow, look at these righteous men. They must be justified. And the Lord coming along and just attacking that. Just attacking that. And then on the flip side, you have the issue of because justification isn't by works, that one could therefore then... See, because that's not where we're supposed to stay. Um, that's part of the issue of growing is to understand that, that you are to know God in such a manner in which it does it, it, it transforms your life because it, it, you're going after conf- being conformed to the image of Christ. And in your works, then, you don't deny him because the works are actually coming from the work of God's word in us. Good questions, though. Any other questions before we conclude? Well, as always, I, uh, I'm honored to... We'll go through a, a book of the Bible with you all and um, gone through 1 Corinthians now and 2 Corinthians and we'll begin Galatians uh, next week for those that weren't here. Uh, I'm tinkering around with the idea, tinkering around with the idea of doing a, a class uh, come the fall, kind of a little bit be different than what we're doing right now. Um, where we have some specific things that we lay out, will lay out on being an ambassador for Christ. And so I've had interest over the years for something like that and uh, thinking about putting it into action. And I'll let you know more of that. But we'll keep going on through Galatians. Galatians is a wonderful epistle. It's a, a, another foundational epistle. epistle uh, very important in understanding with what we were kind of talking about here this, this evening when our Q&A. So... That being said, let's go ahead and pray and conclude. Father, we again thank you for this time. We thank you for this, this letter that is such a pattern for us, an example of the gentleness and meekness of Christ that, that Paul put on display and uh, that he desired to be a helper of their joy. And may we be, uh, understand that very thing and be able to be that towards others um, for their good, for their edification, how we speak what we speak. Uh, as well as knowing the issue of when the right time to rebuke someone sharply uh, for their good, for their edification, Uh, and all in hopes, Father, that they might be presented perfect in Christ Jesus, not just in Christ, but perfect in Christ. And Father, may that be something as Paul strove after that we would strive after. Knowing what your word teaches and what it touches in regards to this life, and what it prepares us for the life that is to come. I thank you for this time that we can redeem to your honor and glory. We pray if someone's here listening, if they have not trusted Christ as their only and all-sufficient Savior, Savior from the debt and penalty of their sins by paying for that debt and penalty on the cross. He was buried the third, uh, and rose again the third day. He was delivered for their offenses and raised again for their justification. He offers that justification to them as a free gift, and they are to receive it by faith and faith alone trusting Christ and his work solely for the salvation from the debt penalty of their sins, which is held in the lake of fire for all eternity, a condemnation that they do not really want. May they believe this very moment, receive the forgiveness of their sins, past, present, and future, the imputation of your righteousness, and possess the gift of eternal life. Give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.